This week on the WriterCon podcast. Listen to the little voice that's in your head telling you to write and write every day. Hey, writers, this is Bill Bernhardt. Laura and I are traveling this weekend, so instead of the usual podcast episode, we're, we've got a special treat for you, a classic interview from uh, that we actually recorded in 2020 with Steve Barry, the incredibly talented New York Times bestselling author, several times off over, started with Cotton Malone, his series character, with the Templar Legacy, and he's just been getting better and more popular ever since. So we're combining the two interviews we did with him through the magic that only Jesse Ulrich can bring to this recording process and sharing it with you. And Laura and Jesse and I will be back with a normal episode next time. So enjoy. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Glad to be here, Bill. All right. Traditional first question. If you could offer one piece of advice to an aspiring writer, what would it be? Listen to the little voice that's in your head telling you to write and write every day. Uh, You know, I think a lot of people hear that voice, but how do you actually make yourself sit down and write? Well, you have to, it takes discipline. Writing, you know, writing is, is a discipline. It's, it's not an obsession. You don't get obsessed with it, but it truly is a discipline. You have to determine, you know, What's the what's your best time of day when you're when is you when are you most productive? For me, it's in the morning time. So mm-hmm. I always set aside two hours every morning. I went to my law office at seven o'clock and I wrote from seven to nine every single morning. This is before I was published uh, writing writing manuscripts. You, you find the time when you're most productive. You sit yourself down. You listen to the little voice and you keep going. Now, you know, I, I you know, you get asked all the time. Why do you write? You write because you have to. If you don't, the little voice will drive you insane. And I've been at it now 30 years and the little voice still drives me insane all the time. So the the best advice to a writer is listen to the little voice, get a routine, stick to it and try to write your words, try to write some words every day. I'm not sure everybody has the same degree of discipline that you do. I remember hearing you speak once and you attributed nuns at a Catholic school where you were educated yeah. for instilling discipline? Yeah, I, I, I was. I went to Catholic school for the first seven years and the nuns taught me discipline because you, you really didn't. I mean, if you didn't, you came in without your homework, you only came once without your homework. You never did it again. And they were tough now. But the way it is that, you know, when I hear writers say that all the time, you know, it all depends on what you want to do. You know, a lot of people don't know my story. I, I guess I should say it very quickly. You know, from the day I wrote my first word to the day I sold my first word was 12 years. 12 years during that period. I wrote eight manuscripts. Five went to New York publishing houses. They were rejected 85 times. I made it on the 86th time, 12 years after I started. So I'm, you know, I'm the living proof you can do it. So you don't want to make excuses if you want to achieve, if you want to be a published writer, if you want to develop an audience and tell stories to people on a wide scale, then you've got to get the discipline in place to produce the product. And you have to teach yourself how to do that. And during that 12 years of rejection, I taught myself how to write a novel in one year. And you have to do the same thing. It it all depends on what you want. If you're just If you're just writing to write, and by the way, the vast majority of writers, that's why they write. They just want to write. But if you're writing to become a commercial fiction writer, then it's a whole different story. And requires a whole new level of discipline, I would think. Absolutely. And that whole time you were doing the 12 years and 85 rejections, you're practicing law full time, right? Absolutely. And I and I wrote seven novels still as a lawyer. I did not quit as a lawyer to novel eight. So I kept going during that 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 process because, you know, I, I wasn't going to quit my day job, for God's sakes. I mean, I you know, I had to make sure that I could make a living at it. I was just fortunate that I was able to make a living at it. So you you just, you know, to be a commercial fiction writer and write for a publishing house is one of the hardest goals to achieve in the business. There's no question about that. But don't tell me you can't do it because I started with 85 rejections, you know, Mm -hmm. and and I made it. So 
other folks can do it too. Absolutely. And for that matter, I talk about practicing law. You you held uh, well, you held a, a public office. You were uh, a, a county. What was what was your office again? I was on the school board for four school years, board. and then I was a county commissioner for ten 20, years. That's what I was. And that was all. That was all during the time I was writing. Mm-hmm. So I actually had three jobs during that time. I was writing. I was a public official, and I was a lawyer. And so and you know. You just balance your time and manage your time properly and make it happen. Sure. Where in that process did you finally land your first agent? That was actually early on, which was really shocking to me. It was about, I would say, five years into the 12. Mm -hmm. uh, I sent out about 500 query letters to agents. I got about 10 back that were kind of you know, lukewarm interested. And then mm. one took me, which is a miracle because getting an agent is probably harder than getting a publisher. And mm-hmm. that's even true today. That's yeah. still true. today. And I was fortunate that uh, Pam Ahern in New Orleans took me and she submitted those five manuscripts to New York. And those were back in the days when you had to print out manuscripts and mail them I, off. I remember. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And stick them <laughs> in self no in Lots of manila envelopes and self-addressed stamp returns. And, yeah. and she did that for seven years and she fronted all the postage. She never sent me a bill for anything. Yeah. And and finally she was there when we did it. And now she gets 15% of my first 10 novels for the rest of her life. Hmm. Well, that's, that's a fantastic story. The first book was, am I right, The Amber Room? First published book, yeah. yeah it was well, the fourth book that I wrote. Yeah, first book. Well, what do you think made the difference? I mean, was it, was it your work improving, or was it just the right book in the right time, or what happened? It was all about timing. The world changed. Oh. Um, during the 90s, my genre was dead. I mean, the spy thriller died right. in, in 1990 when the Cold War ended, so it kind of died. And by 2000, that genre was gone. And then the Da Vinci Code came in 2003 Mm -hmm. and Random House had bought it in 2002. Now, they they had no idea what they had at this point. They just knew they had something kind of fresh and different. Mm -hmm. And my and Dan writes action, history, secrets, conspiracies. That's exactly what I was writing. And so Random House was looking for something to go with Da Vinci. And I got bought to kind of come in on the coattails of Da Vinci and Da Vinci was published in spring of 03. I was published in fall of of 03. And we rode those coattails. And God bless Dan Brown. He brought that genre (laughs) back to life. He did. And and it's still going strong today, thanks to him. And at some point, you had a book called The Templar Legacy, right? Which was the the right word to have in a title. Yeah. What happened was, is I got uh, Amber Room, Romanoff Prophecy, and Third Secret were three of the five that went to the New York houses. So I got to, they got bought the second time around. Mm -hmm. Once those were done, we had to come up with something new. And that was when I created Cotton Malone and wrote The Templar Legacy in the Mm -hmm. spring of 2006. And that was my biggest bestseller and remains to this day my biggest bestselling novel. Really? And that was the first with your series character, with Cotton Malone. Correct. Wow. Cotton Malone, yeah. Templar was a magic word then, and it just did so good. And as I said, to this day, that book still sells solid. That was the, the, the how many Cotton Malone novels have there been now? Fifteen. The most recent being uh, the Warsaw Protocol, right? Correct. It just came out about it in uh, end of February. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's out. It's out now, and it's the fifteenth Cotton Malone adventure. Out now. It's on the New York Times bestseller list as we're speaking. <laughs> I, was, I was very fortunate. This one went, made it to number two, and I was very fortunate to to get to number two. It's really cool. Uh, yeah. What, <laughs> what do you think of as uh, you know? What uh, lessons have you learned along the way after? having done what at least 20 novels now yeah this is my this is the 19th printed book for me i've written 24 right but published 19 so um um what have i learned i mean you you learn a lot i Mm -hmm. mean you you learn how to how to keep the story going how to pace Mm -hmm. it how to 
how to keep readers interest. You learn to try to find the right subject matters. You try to write a high concept book that's going to play well all over the world. You, you learn a lot. I'm, I've made mistakes too. I mean, I've made my share of mistakes and you learn from those as well. Well, I'm toying with whether I should even ask, but okay, what are the mistakes <laughs> that you've made? <laughs> Along the way, um, a couple of covers that were oh, poor choices. Sure. Uh, and I went along with, with both of them. Um, even though I knew better on one, the other I, I, I loved, but it just didn't, it didn't work. Cover, huh. cover matters. Uh, uh, writers today better be aware of that. The cover on your book matters a whole bunch. And I made a couple of, uh, of tactical mistakes uh, with those covers and I paid the price for them and poor sales. One of those was the, um, uh, Columbus Affair. Mm-hmm. The Columbus Affair cover, I, the original hardcover cover, I loved it. It was a beautiful cover. It was cool. It was different. It was interesting. Um, and the Columbus Affair is a standalone novel. It's not right. a Cotton Malone book. It's a, it's another character. And that book just tanked right out of the box. It did not do well. And we reco- we recovered it for the mass market, which did very well. And mm-hmm. With the repackaging of it today, that novel's my third or fourth best-selling novel. So it's it's packaging matters, and I we made up some packaging decisions that weren't that weren't good back then, you know. So you you those those couple of things you know came back to bite me, and I learned my lesson. I'm very 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 conscious of covers today. Well, was it too busy or the wrong color, or what do you think was the problem? didn't have the elements that my readers wanted on there, the, mm. the clear historical element. Uh. Uh, it didn't have it. It was too nebulous. It was also not a Cotton Malone book, which is another problem with it. Right. Um, I did not want to write the standalone. My publisher insisted I do that. That's another error, but uh, I didn't have a choice. That I sounds like do. the opposite of what a publisher would ask you to do. Well, that's, I would I would agree, but at that time they they had this idea of bringing in new readers by doing something different. I was completely against it, but I did it as a team player, and sure enough, my instincts were correct. Wow. It was not a good idea. Now, over time, that book has done exactly what they thought it would do. Uh, people read it, love it, go pick up the other novels because mm-hmm. it's a different character. It's a guy named Tom Sagan. He's an ex-journalist, but the book is Action, History, Secrets, Conspiracies, just like Cotton Malone. It's a terrific novel. I love the novel Mm -hmm. because it deals with something with Christopher Columbus, something out of the island of Jamaica that's real, some really cool stuff. And, you know, over time, that book has done really well and has driven people. If you go to the Amazon page for the Columbus Affair and look at what people also buy, it always includes all of my Cotton Malone books. So right. in the end, they were right. In the long term, they were correct. In the short term, no, it was a disaster. Mm. Hmm. You talked a minute ago about uh, the importance of keeping the story going. Do you do you find that more challenging? I mean, you've done this 20 plus times now. Is it You can't just have somebody pull out a gun every time you need a chapter oh. in. Oh, it's becoming much more of a challenge because after 20 books, you you've kind of run out of things you've done. You've Mm -hmm. got to come up with new, fresh things and it gets, it gets harder. I was told once that the longer you write, the harder it gets. And they're absolutely correct because you, uh, you get a little better mastery of your craft and you produce a better manuscript, no question, but the originality begins to suffer and you have to, you have to stay fresh. Mm -hmm. Uh, The one thing you don't want to do is the same thing over and over again. Right. You had a book which ends with, and I apologize for not remembering the title, but just when you think Cotton's going to get to sit down for a minute, he basically hears a noise downstairs, grabs his gun, and that's the end of the book. Yep, I did that. Which one was that? I believe that was uh, in uh, The Charlemagne Pursuit, and I ended it that way. The story's over. Everything's over. Everything's tied up. There's no loose ends. There's a break, and then um, uh, he hears that noise, grabs his gun. I ended it. Then I mm-hmm. started the next novel at that moment. Sure. And uh, it worked great. It oh, was wonderful. I, I just did it again in the Warsaw Protocol. I mean, in the um, 
last year's book, the Malta Exchange, I did it there too, with mm -hmm. uh, it all being over. Cassiopeia and Cotton are in the restaurant, and Danny Daniel shows up. Look on his face. There's trouble. Book ended. Next book mm -hmm. starts mm -hmm. right at that mm -hmm. moment. So well, I, that's why it stuck in my mind because as I read it, I thought this is brilliant. That is different. Something that hadn't, I think, been in your previous books and works. So, I mean, who isn't desperate to read the next book after that? Well, that's what you want to do. The one thing you don't want to do, and I would caution writers with this, is you do not want to leave a story element of that book hanging on at the end. Right. Because you cannot assume people are going to read the next book. That's creating almost a serial at that point. Right. Now, serials work great in mysteries. They work great in romance. They work great in fantasy. They do not work so great in thrillers. Mm -hmm. No, that's not what you told. You finished the story yeah, and right. then gave people a little teaser of what's next. Right. And it, and I, like I said, I liked it. So I did it again wow. last year and I started Warsaw at the moment the other one ended. Mm. Really good stuff. Uh, what you you mentioned thrillers. I think that you've always been devoted to thrillers. Like even before you were published, thrillers were your main jam, right? Oh yeah, that's what I love to read. Absolutely. So that history, I love to read history and thrillers. Mm -hmm. And I I, I want to mention that you were one of the founding members of ITW International Thriller Writers and been president or co-president, I don't know how many times, but <laughs> you're, you're the driving force. Uh, uh, just once. I was a found, one of the founding members, and I served three years as co-president. And then mm -hmm. I've been on the board uh, as vice president of publications for many years. Am I right in thinking that ITW now has over 6,000 members? It's approaching 6,000, yes. That, I mean, is there any other writing group that even comes close to that? That's extraordinary. I don't know how many are in MWA now. I don't I don't know the answer to that question. I know that when I was president, we had about 300 members because you know, <laughs> I was I was president in its infancy when yeah. it first started. When I left office, we had about 1500 or so. And it's just been growing steadily ever since. And now we're in like 40 countries around the world. So the word international in international thriller writers is quite significant. Mm -hmm. And am I right in thinking the organization still doesn't charge dues? Not a bit. We got rid of those in 2007, I think. Uh, we, we support the organization from our publications. Mm -hmm. We've been very fortunate. We've had some very successful publications that have made us a lot of money. So the organization is, is, is properly endowed. Mm, fantastic. Steve, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Great to, great to be here, Bill. Steve, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be back again, Bill. I wanted to talk to you this time about series characters, because I know there's a lot of interest in series characters, a lot of demand for them. Uh, it seems to be uh, more of a popular way for writers to go than it has been in the past, and you, of course, with Cotton Malone, have one of the most successful series characters out there. Uh, but I remember you didn't start with Cotton Malone. You did uh, two, three novels, three. Before, three novels, and then with the Templar Legacy, introduced Cotton Malone. What what made you decide to create a series character? Well, it was really Random House's idea. Really, uh, Mark Tumani my editor at the time said, let's create a series. And that was a little weird for me because I don't read series. Mm -hmm. I mean, I never really have read series. Now I read Dirk Pitt, you know, Clive Cussler, yes. but those really aren't a series. Those are each kind of standalone books. Every one of them are standalone books. They just happen to go one after the other. Um, I wasn't a big series character uh, reader. So it was a little difficult for me to figure out how to do that. So we created Caught Malone and wrote the Templar Legacy. And when I wrote it, I did not have any illusions that I was going to get to do this 15 more times. I was just <laughs> hoping to get through it, you know, one time. So I, mm -hmm. I, I created Cotton mm -hmm. and he did very well, very, very well. I mean, as I said, that's my biggest selling book then and biggest selling book of all time is mm -hmm. the Templar Legacy. It still sells a lot of copies today. And Cotton was created, and so we we kept him going. Now mm -hmm. What I've learned, 
And I learned this from Lee Child. He taught me this because he writes the Jack Reacher books. And each book in a series has to be the same but different. The same but different. Now, how does that, how do you make that? That's a, that's a tough, that's a tall order now. So how are they the same? Well, there are, every book is action, history, secrets, conspiracies. Okay. How is it different? Different history, different protagonists, different so what's, different settings. Everything about the book is different than the other. The only thing the same is action, history, secrets, conspiracies. And of course, the character Cotton Malone. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've learned that trick. I write, I've written 15 Cotton Malone books, Mm -hmm. and I get asked all the time, do you have to read them in order? Absolutely not. You can read them in any order you please. I write them where you can come in and out of the series however you want, and that's what I learned from Lee. Hmm. The same but different. I mean, you're basically saying every book can't be exactly the same, but sort of every book needs to be the same, except in, in, in different words. Uh, and in different in different settings mm-hmm. and different motivations, right? All those kinds of things. I, every one of my books are utterly different, utterly different, but they are the same because they involve action, history, mm-hmm. secrets, conspiracies. Is it challenging to come up with those new fresh elements? Extremely challenging. It gets harder and harder every year because I want something that no one's ever touched before. I don't want to do what someone's someone's up done, and I, I'm. It's hard. I have to find that thing from history, that thing from the past that's real. I cannot make it up. It's got to be real. And it's got to be something that's going to interest me and is going to interest the reader. And then I have to make it relevant today. It still has to matter today, that thing from the past. Mm -hmm. I call it the ooh factor, the thing from the past, thing that kind of makes you go ooh like Templars or Charlemagne or mm-hmm. those kinds of things. And then the other thing is the so what? Who mm-hmm. cares if we find the Library of Alexandria? Mm-hmm. Who cares if Queen Elizabeth I was a man? Who cares, uh, you know, uh, about the Templars one way or the other? What does it matter? I have to have that so what today. Mm-hmm. And they're hard to, they're getting harder and harder to find. But thankfully, I'm okay for about, Four more years, at least. <laughs> and then a new series character? No, no. I just have to come up with a new idea. Oh. I, I have, I have, I'm okay for oh. 21, 22, 23. I'm okay. Oh, you're saying you've got four years, uh, four years of ideas or stakes planned. Yeah, well, well, the 2021 novel's finished. It's already turned in. Because, mm-hmm. you know, you do a year in advance in the book business. So I turned it in this year to publish next year. I'm writing the 2022 novel. That will be turned in later this year. And then I've already got the ideas for 23 and 24. So as I said, I'm OK for four years. Hopefully within the next four years, I'll find a couple more ideas. I have a hunch you will. What What were the elements uh, or what were you thinking of when you created Cotton Malone? Copenhagen, used bookseller. <laughs> Uh, former yeah, was, government uh, server. What, what, what were you trying to do there? Uh, how are you going to make him appealing? Well, I wanted him to be different. You've got to create somebody a little different. Mm-hmm. And so I was in Copenhagen when he was born. I was in Ibro Plods, which is a square there. I was eating at the Cafe Nordon, and there I was, and he came into my brain. Huh. Uh, he's going to be a retired Justice Department agent. He's going to own an old bookshop. Because you love old bookshops, right? Bookshops, yeah. And he's going to uh, uh, be get himself into trouble all the mm-hmm. time. And he kind of came into my brain, and I wrote down the elements of what he should be. And I went back home, I wrote the Templar legacy and created him. Now, the, what I wanted from him, He's not a Daniel Craig kind of guy. He's not. He doesn't work out every day. He doesn't run twenty miles. He doesn't bench press. He he's an ordinary guy who can do extraordinary things when called upon. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why he's kind of caught on because he's not a superhero. He makes Mm -hmm. mistakes. He screws up, but he fixes it in the end. You know, you mentioned Daniel Craig, uh, James Bond actor, obviously, but it occurs to me that in the early Ian Fleming novels, James Bond is much more ordinary, 
even talking about how boring he is in real life, but rises to the occasion. Uh, right. that, that's, that's where I, a lot of uh, some of that came to me from reading those early Ian Fleming novels. The James Bond of the movies and the James Bond that Fleming created originally are not the same character. Right. Especially uh, in the early the, novels. Right. And because the best spy is the one you never notice. Which that's, makes a lot of sense. Who would not right. notice? <laughs> <laughs> And I assume Cotton was a former government agent uh, because that gives him skills. Even if he's not working out every day, he can handle himself if he needs to. You have to have that element in there. But I made him retire. So he he quit it early and he moves to Copenhagen, divorces his wife, moves over, owns an old bookshop, and just kind of gets drugged back in all the time Mm -hmm. against his will. Yeah. You know, and so, and, and I use those personal motivations for, lot of books, but hell, about eight or nine books in, you just run out of them. So I had mm-hmm. to transition him over. And now he basically works for hire. Right. Now, speaking of not being James Bond, uh, Cotton is very successful, you know, professionally dealing with the bad guys, but considerably less so in his personal life. Was that an, a deliberate choice? Yes. He's terrible with women. Mm-hmm. Terrible. He just, he's not good with it at all. He's divorced from his wife. He has a son that's not biologically his. Mm. Um, he has to deal with that. That's dealt with in several of the novels. And he uh, he has a father that he that died when he was age 10. And that was dealt with in the Charlemagne pursuit. Um, he, and, and then he, he meets Cassiopeia. And in the beginning, Cassiopeia was not supposed to be really a love interest for Cotton. She was just kind of kind of come in and go out. But she stuck around and she's there now and now they have a relationship and they, and she's become a very popular character. And when I don't put her in a book, I catch hell for it. (laughs) She was introduced. Am I thinking right? In one of the short stories. She was introduced in the, uh, in the Templar legacy. Oh, I actually introduced her there, but she was a kind of a, she was not a major player in that. Okay. Uh, So, I wasn't going to keep her, but uh, Elizabeth, my wife, said that that wasn't an option. So she had to stay. So because Cassiopeia is basically her. Ah, so she wanted she wanted her to continue. And so she has. And now I actually broke them up at the end of one of the novels. Um, I actually ended their relationship completely. And she had read the, the, the she's the first reader of my manuscript when it's finished. And she read it. She came in. She threw it on the table. And she says, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, just, not going to happen. I fix it next book. So I did. Oh, wow. That's, that's like Edgar Rice Burroughs trying to kill off Tarzan's Jane and publishers saying, nah. <laughs> I would say Liz earned a new pair of shoes on that one. Uh, she did. She tried. Uh, I mean, I, I, I never intended Cotton to be monogamous. And, and let me tell you why. And because when you write a series, and if you'll notice this on television and all, the protagonist of the of the of the TV series almost never have a family. Right. They never have a wife. They never have a husband. They have ex wives, ex husbands, and ex families. And the reason for that is, as you well know, you've written this too. They get in the way after a while. Right. You know, they just kind of get in the way. We're writing a story. Each one member has to be the same but different. Mm -hmm. And you can't sit around and deal with a family in every story and introduce everybody and go through all of that. It's better to keep them kind of freelance. And I always wanted Cotton to play the field. He was never to be monogamous. But again, Elizabeth, there's where she stepped in. She says that's not going to happen either. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's now kind of settled down with Cassiopeia and uh, I confess, I wish he could play the field a little bit. I think it'd be a little more fun from a writing standpoint. Well, a relationship limits, uh, you know, cuts off. But then again, given how poor Cotton was with women, maybe this is for the best. Yeah, and she understands him and she gets him and she knows how to deal with him and he knows how to deal with her. And it's worked out very well. Cassiope comes about every other book. I don't have her in every novel. Uh, about every other book. And when she's not there, I bring in another character called Luke Daniels, who's a younger guy. Mm-hmm. He's a younger version of Cotton. So I can have a character who can make mistakes and screw up and really, 
you know, because he's learning on the job. And Luke comes in when Cassiopeia is not there. Maybe it's my imagination, but I think that Cotton's imperfections are not good with women. His personal life was a mess. Better now with Cassiopeia, yeah. but, but I think that's part of the appeal. I think that's what humanizes him and makes people want to read more of him. That's what I was hoping, too. I mean, that's why I gave him those imperfections. I I wanted him to be someone we all know and someone like you don't mind being stuck on an elevator with him. That yeah. kind of guy. You think you'll get tired of Cotton? You mentioned Lee Child a minute ago, who, of course, has announced that he's done writing the Reacher books. Uh, he is passing but, but the his torch. Going to take him over, right? So you think you'll ever do something like that? I think not, not any time soon. I think me and Cotton are going to be together for a while. I, he 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 serves me well. He does a great job, and I like him and I enjoy him. So I'd like to keep him going. I wouldn't mind branching out a little bit. I wouldn't mind Luke Daniels having his own book. I wouldn't mind mm-hmm. Cassiopeia having her own book. Um, that would be fun to do, yeah. but I don't want to get rid of Cotton. No. That's sensible. <laughs> Can we talk a minute uh, about history? Your books are so steeped in history. That, too, is clearly one of the appeals. Uh, people learn a little something at the s- same time they're being uh, entertained <sighs> How do you come up with that stuff? What kind of research do you do? Well, it takes it's about an 18 month process to research one of my novels. Um, mm. I do it six months. The last six months of writing the novel or I start researching the next one. And so I use around 400 sources to write a novel. And those are books. I use physical books. Wow. I buy the vast majority of them at a giant um used a bookshop here and it's in Jacksonville called the Chamblin book mine. It's a wonderful place. It's a, he's got incredible selections in there, just thousands, tens of thousands of volumes. I'm very fortunate to have that where I can go get the material I need. And I, I don't read 400 books, but I do read large chunks of 400 books. And I take a lot of notes out of those books and those notes stack about six inches high. And of that stack, I'm only going to use about 10% of the information in there. And I don't know when I'm going to use it till I start writing the novel. The hardest thing for folks in my genre is mixing information with action. It's the hardest Mm -hmm. thing to do. And I'm not saying I'm great at it or I'm wonderful at it. I'm only saying I'm very conscious of it. And I make a very conscious effort to mix the information with the action as carefully as I can, so you don't get too much of either one of those. Right. No, actually, you're very good at it. The integration of exposition, so the plot doesn't ground to a halt, <laughs> or people feel like they're being lectured, but right. still, you you give it that fascinating nonfiction, uh, extra layer, subtext, whatever you want to call it. It's It's one of the things that makes your book special. Thank you. The, the trick is, is for them to be reading down the page and all at once they just realize they learned something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And they, and they never they never realized it till they got about three paragraphs down. Mm. They go, oh, I just learned something. That's the trick. <laughs> you can do that. That's, that's, the, that's the goal. Yeah. Since we're talking about history, can we talk a minute about History Matters, your nonprofit, which... Uh, sure. among other things, I think, is helping to preserve historical landmarks. How did that come about? About uh, 11 years ago, we decided we want to try to give back a little bit. So Elizabeth and I created History Matters. And what we do is we go around to communities. We help them raise money for their local historical projects. Uh, we've done libraries, buildings, posters, documents, books, cemeteries, you name it, we've raised money for it. About 90 projects around the country and one wow. in Canada. And we've raised a little over $2 million for, for those various historical projects. Um, historical preservation is a local thing. There's no one going to come do it for you. You've got to do it yourself. And we help communities with that. It's been very gratifying. And hmm. we don't do as many as we used to. We do one or two a year now. And we try to find the right thing. And if we find the right thing, we we go for it. Mm, That's fantastic work, though. You've really (coughs) taken on some fantastic projects. Steve, thanks again for being on the podcast. Great to to be here, Bill. Bye-bye. 
Thank you again, Steve, for that wonderful interview. And let me remind everyone first, of course, you knew I was going to say this final verdict, the sixth and final ben- Daniel Pike book is now available for pre order. And this is a great time to send me any suggestions regarding this podcast, my website, the WriterCon website, the conference, the retreats, or anything else. My email address again is wb at williambernhardt.com. Your ratings and reviews of this podcast are always appreciated. Until next time, it'll be a whole new year when I talk to you next. So you know what I think your New Year's resolution ought to be. Keep writing. Make yourself write every day. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. 